I get everybody to start taking their seats, please. So we're blessed to have a tremendous flag general officer SES panel here today with us uh, for the second event uh, this morning, close out this morning's uh, efforts. Uh, we try to bring the best and brightest, and we certainly have uh, succeeded in that today. Uh, just a whole load of, of great talent here, and I know they're going to look for your questions. So as a matter of administration, we're going to go through the, uh, the panel, going to make some remarks in, uh, individually, and then we will open up for a uh, question and answer period. So you should find a question and answer or question card inside your program. I would ask you a couple, three things on this. Uh, staff will pick it up after you're uh, through with it. it. If you can get it on one side of the, of the page, that would be nice. If you can make it legible, that would be really terrific. And if it could really have a question in there, that would be even better. So please, uh, probably won't get to all of them, but uh, you know, try to make it high level, uh, respectable, and, um, and we'll be screening. So I'll take names for those that are off the page. So anyway, the, uh, the panel is uh, going to talk about the, uh, the, the general theme, harnessing new technologies, as well as uh, give us highlights of what's going on in, in their particular domain. Uh, I expect that, that uh, we have a wide ranging all the way from OSD down to uh, a NATO rep this year. And uh, so they'll, they'll give you their insights, and then we'll have, hopefully have a discussion. At this point, I'm just going to introduce them as a group. Uh, I'm going to refer to the program for the details of their biographies. There, there's too much there. It's rich. Uh, but I'll just go down the list here and, and introduce our panel for today. Uh, first, we got uh, Fred Drummond. He serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Education and Training, and in that role, oversees the development of policies and plans for uh, military training and education. Um, a most notable factoid that I learned, he, he's a recipient of a Distinguished Flying Cross, flying EF-111s in uh, Iraq. So that, I mean, that's kind of the quality of what we got going on up here. I'm so, a uh, Well, that's okay. <laughs> just, you were there. Just got to throw the Navy thing out there. Yeah, <laughs> just to throw the gauntlet down on, uh, on war stories. Uh, next to him is Vice Admiral uh, Paul Grossklag. Uh, G9 is a Cyril Itzik uh, panelist here. This is his third year, a uh, great friend of ours. He's the head of the Naval Air Systems Command. Uh, we also have Lieutenant General uh, Mike Lundy, who uh, runs the U.S. Army uh, Combined Arms, Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth. And uh, we, we look forward to your remarks, sir, as well. Uh, we also have Major General Scott Smith, who's escaped the Pentagon, uh, serves as the Director of Training and Readiness, the Chief of Staff of, uh, of the Air Force at headquarters, uh, U.S. Air Force. And he also has a rich heritage of command and uh, squadrons, wings, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So an, another top notch. Uh, next to him is Major General Kevin Iams. An F-18 background, Marine, all weather, a uh, whole host of combat in his history, and he currently runs the Training Education Command for the Marine Corps. And last but not least, we've got Brigadier General uh, Heinrich Sommer from uh, NATO. He's from the Allied uh, Command Transformation in Norfolk. Uh, he's overseeing uh, many operations. He's had many operational deployments uh, and uh, as an uh, Army uh, Danish Army, uh, the Danish Army, and joins NATO uh, to work on um, capabilities, engineering, and innovation. So that's that's right in our lane as well. So we usually would go from left to right in terms of remarks, but uh, we had a, a medical emergency here a little while ago, and General Iams has had uh, his deputy actually fell ill. So I'm going to ask him to to start us, and then he's going to be uh, replaced by uh, Colonel Yates.
Admiral Robb, Mr. Hutchins, General Cole, its a council and uh, colleagues on the panel. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you at the uh, the ITSIC conference and to the three stars. Thank you for letting me overstep a uh, little bit of protocol here for a uh, bit of an emergency today. But uh, for 242 years, your Marine Corps has been transforming our young Americans uh, into Marines using the best techniques that uh, the field training craft could provide. However, as you know, with the proliferation of threats, uh, multi-domain, multi-spectral, uh, anti-access aerial denial type threats, it's really time for all of us to step into the 21st century uh, and with the, uh, the Marine Corps, with our fifth generation assets, into a fifth generation Marine Corps and MAGTAF. Our Marine Corps has already stepped out in this venture with a significant study and investment into our Force 2025, the Marine Operating Concept, uh, in conjunction with our naval counterparts, to develop that fifth generation MAGTAF. As you see ex execute, you'll see us now have reconfigured the, uh, the MAGTAF from the MEF level uh, and the way that we fight all the way down to the rifle squads now. As well, we've reflected on what the national defense strategy has told us and that we need to be prepared for the Corps to operate in complex terrain, uh, to be prepared for technological uh, proliferation, using information as a weapon, manage our own battlefield signatures into the future, and to fight and win in contested environments. And for the Marine Corps, that does not just mean the littorals. It also means the mega urban operations uh, that we see in our future, subterranean, and probably most importantly has been pointed out uh, several times today, the information domain. And if we truly are gonna put our money where our mouth is and train as we fight, we need an environment that goes well beyond what we currently generate for integrated operations. We need an environment that replicates the resolution and sensory fidelity necessary to drive perceptions and cognitive reactions approaching those that one commander might expect to see in the, either the current or the future world conflicts. To achieve this goal, we see that we need more blended and immersive training venues to peak that full array of sensors. Uh, and senses without having to bring live into the conversation uh, every single time. For the Marine Corps, we have our infantry immersion trainers that we are continuing to build out. We've invested about $20 million every year over the next uh, remaining years of the fight up and have $25 million invested currently in building out the Camp Lejeune model from what is only an indoor to mimic what we have at Camp Pendleton, which is a, uh, a full indoor-outdoor capability. As we continue to build them out, we've got uh, appropriate uh, role players and aggressors. But if you think about it, in this day and age, um, as the general pointed out earlier today, the cost to continue to train in this manner just becomes prohibitive. And what we need to do is we need to look at how we're going to replace these in the future in very large measure with avatars and simulation. As well, our Marine Corps is seeking greater numbers of simulation events. We're building them into our training and readiness manuals and looking for simulation assets that can drive that decision making under the most austere and challenging of environments. As of right now, our Marine Corps is fielding the tactical decision kits out to all 24 of our Marine Corps infantry battalions. Uh, these are um, virtual training uh, laptops that we've got out there in the fleet they give our lower echelon Marines the opportunity to do squad level immersive training, first person shooter, uh, competitions uh, to inspire them, hopefully this next generation, better than our generation, to embrace simulation uh, to a level that we just have not before. Because as uh, General Perkins uh, put it, it's, it's not what we're doing now, it's what we're going to be able to do in the future. And it's about the next generations embracing the level of training that we have not been able to put onto the field uh, in our generation. We also need these venues and assets to be exceptionally adaptive uh, and contain a wide gamut of free play such that our commanders and Marines can explore new concepts and their new TTPs. Our Marine Corps and the way that we operate, our primary warfighting document is MCDP-1, warfighting, founded on the principles of maneuver warfare and for my Army counterparts, mission type orders, where Marines, soldiers, sailor, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen must use initiative, boldness, 
and intelligence to capitalize on the fleeting opportunities that will be present on the future battlefield. We need scenarios with liberal free play that allows the individual and the unit commander and the entities to seize and maintain initiative in the face of uncertain, uncertainty and risk. And we need the opportunity for leaders to understand that imperfect results will result from what you thought was a perfect solution. And that in combat, you need to learn to accept adverse outcomes uh, and then rapidly move on from those mistakes. So from our squad leaders to our MAGTAF commanders, all leaders will be expected to prevail in uncertain and volatile environments. And then from our Marine Corps, with our very low officer to enlisted ratio, it's taken that we must have more strategic corporals, but at the same time, we need very highly talented, high-level leadership. So we envision an LVC training environment, or as we call it, the MIXT, the Marine Corps Synthetic Training Environment, being a vehicle to train not only our MSC headquarters, but the subordinate headquarters, and all the way down to those young Marine leaders, both mentally and physically, in these demanding roles and in these LVC environments. We also see that we need to network these simulations from across the Corps to, again, build home training solutions uh, that can then be fed into collective venues, such that as we get together, we are going to build one training venue that can be repeated multiple times. Uh, for the Marine Corps, we assess that we would like to build this out at the, the future training facility at 29 Palms. And with the rising information warfare domain, our MAGTAF tactical grid now becomes the key element in integrating and leveraging the synergy and capability of our fifth generation platforms, the F-35, the MV-22, future assets and UAS, as well as our distributive MAGTAF operations with our Navy counterparts. Our training environments must continue to transition actions and effects of the platforms and the Marines across multiple domains, especially the information domain in near real time. And with hyper accurate location position for friendly units and target location uh, for the enemy, such that we possess a single simulator avatar image for the training audience. And as we employ our high demand fifth gen assets, it won't be and cannot be a one and done event. We need, as was previously stated, these sets and reps in order to refine the TTPs and build that combat muscle memory. We're looking for an LVC training environment that lets us plan and execute and probably just as important, control in real time. But then to archive the actions and decisions that were made in the training environment, compile that data for reconstruction, and then debrief. And then repeat, repeat, repeat until mastered without putting the unnecessary wear and tear on our very valuable combat assets. The bottom line moving forward is that our Marines must train and exercise in complex and volatile conditions and against what we used to say near peer, what I would say now are peer level threats who possess not just the will, but the intellect, the capability and the capacity to oppose us. We need to be upping the operational risk in the mind and the eye of the commander and the Marines while reducing the actual risk to the force. The intent is to develop the cognitive capabilities of creative leaders who think in advance at least as fast as the world around them, if not faster, if we expect them to succeed in combat. They must learn to innovate for the future, adapt to overcome, and always win. Always win. To do this, there's only one training regime short of actual battlefield that allows us to do this. And this is the virtual and sim world that we, in this collective, will build for this great nation. So hopefully in my quick overview from the Marine Corps perspective, you're aware of how aggressively the Marine Corps, my command, Training and Education Command, and PM Traces are getting after the guidance from our commandants, the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of the Navy on these initiatives. We cannot tackle this alone. We know that we need our DOD counterparts in the industry to do so. And we look forward to this venue, to getting together with you to not just proceed towards venues that are beneficial to one service or the DOD, but to the larger content of this great nation. 
I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. God bless. Colonel Yates. I'd like to now invite Mr. Drummond to make his remarks. Good morning. I'm from D.C. and I'm here to help. <laughs> really. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this morning with this august group of uh, folks, our collaborative team across the board from uh, the services industry partners, our international partners in particular. Uh, this is a terrific opportunity for me to see and interact with you all firsthand and to put my message out uh, to all of you of how we can help you uh, achieve our collective goals. So I'll start, uh, as we've heard from uh, Secretary Mattis's quotes, I'll uh, just to provide a framework for my comments, his three priorities for uh, the DOD. It's first, restore military readiness, readiness and lethality for a more lethal force. Second, to strengthen alliances and attract new partners. And thirdly, to bring business reforms to the Department of Defense. And we've heard those topics really touched upon by our two keynote speakers this morning. So we're all operating already, not surprisingly, on the same wavelength. So how can we help you in D.C.? So I run policy for force education and training for the services. Policy can be good or bad. It does provide, on a good standpoint, a unity of effort and uh, clear direction and guidance from SECDEF where he's taking our armed forces and uh, our capabilities. But what I'm offering to the services and to all of you, what I need your help in is if you need policies that will uh, enable and improve the way you're doing business or get to the directions that you want to go into, let us know. If there are policies that need changing, adapting to this new world that we're living in, operating in, let's do it. Let us know. And most importantly, if something is obsolete, old and in the way, let me know and we'll kill it. We'll put out something uh, new if we need to, but we want to get out of your way. We want to uh, be a conduit for you, the services and our partners, to improve the training, to directly improve the lethality, because at the end of the day, we are talking about uh, both the U.S. and our coalition, NATO uh, uh, partners, is a more lethal force across the board. It's about the individual warfighter. So one aspect that uh, we handled, which I inherited coming into this job, is a policy change for the way we're doing business. Uh, combatant commanders exercise engagement uh, training transformation program. It was a partnership, and it is a partnership with the joint staff. It used to be that my office ran both the execution piece and the policy piece. Well, in terms of expediency, it made more sense to send the execution piece to joint staff J7, the operators directing the money for the training of the operators. Uh, this is a great thing. We retain the policy. This is the direction I think we're going to see more of. If, it, if there's a better way to do business, then we want to, to do that. I want to also put in a plug in. This is, uh, relates to particularly your strengthening alliances and attracting new partners. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Say Schatz, who's going to be leading uh, up a couple discussions uh, during this uh, conference. She heads up the Advanced Distributive Learning Initiative, which includes so many of you, both uh, domestic and international partners, uh, for that. And last night, we concluded with our Swedish partners, we brought them into the ADL family, a long uh, development program that brought them here, but we're extremely pleased. We're now officially linked with them, especially the very important partnership for uh, Viking 18 that's going to be happening next year. Again, another example of where we are just more than policy. We're actually moving things forward and spreading information and best business practices, best learning practices, best information practices across our entire partnership. Um, third, uh, business reforms. We heard this morning about our acquisition times. We all know with the VR world, AR, LBC, AI, development of machine learning, we in the military, we in the DOD are just too slow to take advantage of that stuff. It's a challenge that we're all going to continue to face uh, and, and work through. But there is something we can do from 
that the services, I speak as a former manpower person, really have to be cognizant enough, and I know we are, and I know you'll hear from the Navy, uh, particularly on Ready Relevant Learning, but as we take advantage of everything that uh, we're seeing here in these few days, uh, in the booths and the, the demonstrations and the talks, is how do we how do we actually implement that from a service in, or services endpoint? We have the industrial base training mechanism that we put groups of people through on a preset time frame, and then we dump them out at the end, and then we send them to their particular operational billets. Well, when we're looking at and we have the capability now to do individualized learning then uh, Airman Smith is gonna be finished much, much quicker, and she's ready to go to her first unit now. There is not a, why do we need to keep her around for another six or eight weeks, because that's what the course length uh, is determined to be. She's ready, let's send her. We have to put systems in place that are flexible enough to do that. That is a challenge that we're going to have to work through. I know we are thinking about it, but we should not be too late. And again, I bring it back to the policy standpoint, me representing all of OSD, bringing this back, what can we do? How can I talk to my counterparts? What do I need to tell to my counterparts? You should engage directly with the other OSD counterparts from the personnel standpoint. What can we do to help facilitate those actions for you? There's so much more to talk about. I won't. I'll just close up with a, a, a Secretary Mattis quote. Uh, there is no room for complacency in the Department of Defense. That's our mantra. That's where we're living at. We're here to partner with you. Please stay in touch. Uh, I am open to talk with everybody anytime. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. So now G9 is, is up. We've given the, the panelists the option to either stand or sit. I think you've um, chosen the sitting option. I've chosen. <coughs> Mike's on. I've chosen to sit. Um, I, this is the third year, as Jim said, that I've done this, and uh, I decided to change up one thing. Um, so I'm not going to stand, but I am going to put a slide up, which I do with a little bit of hesitation. I haven't done that in the past. Uh, the worry is that it will distract from the words that are coming out of my mouth uh, as you try and decipher the slide that I'm going to put up there. Uh, but it sets a little bit of the context, and if I could get that slide up. Thank you. Um, Capabilities-based acquisition is a, uh, a process change at the Naval Air Systems Command that we're trying to put in place um, that we believe is going to significantly increase the speed at which we're able to deliver new capabilities to our sailors and Marines. But just as importantly, we believe that it's going to result in a product that we deliver in the end that is actually more useful to those sailors and Marines on day one than the products that we deliver today. So now I'm going to spend five minutes talking about uh, everything except what's on that slide. So you have a choice to listen or, or read the slide. I'll leave it up to you. Um, one of the tenets of capabilities-based acquisition is that we have to start with the end in mind. And typically when I say that, people go, well, of course we do. We always start with the end in mind. We've got the capabilities uh, requirements document. It says it the system has to go this far, this fast, it has to do it that many times, it has to carry that much ordinance. Um, that's the end state, that's what we're trying to build. My, my talk about the end state is at a different level. It's an end state that I think applies to every single product that we collectively deliver to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. And I think they, just like us, are looking for three things when we get a new product delivered to our doorstep. So think about what you bought on Black Friday or yesterday on Cyber Monday or what you're going to buy your, your spouse for Christmas. And I think you're going to want to know three things. The first thing our warfighters want to know, though, when they get that new product on the flight line is, how does it perform? They want to make sure that it's been fully characterized before they take delivery of it. Not only what it can do, but what it can't do. And I would argue that collectively across DOD, we probably do a pretty good job with this first of the three things that our warfighters expect. Um, speaking from NAVAIR specifically, we test the crap out of stuff. We probably test too much. And we probably focus our test efforts, uh, I'll say they're a little misplaced because we tend to focus on making sure that industry is complying with the 20,000 shell statements in the specification as opposed to focusing on the capability that the warfighter really wants to fill that capability gap. 
But in general, I think we do a pretty good job of characterizing the performance of the system. The second thing that we're looking for, or that the warfighter is looking for, is that when that thing is delivered, that product is delivered on day one, that it's integrated and interoperable with the other systems that they're expected to utilize it with on day one. But that's not how we design our systems today. That's not how the system is built. We build our requirements by platform. We build our budgets by platform. We do our acquisition by ACAT platforms. The Hill looks at our budget by platforms. We don't put out requirements. We don't fund. We don't build acquisition programs for capabilities, integrated capabilities, which is really what the warfighter expects to be delivered. Too often, we wait until six months, a year, two years after we deliver the initial product for the warfighter to come back to us and go, hey, it would be really nice if my F-35 could talk to my Aegis class cruisers and destroyers. It would have been really nice when we integrated or introduced our MH-60 helicopters if they could have sent data to the aircraft and the rest of the carrier air wing. But that wasn't part of that monolithic, that siloed platform program of record. My belief is that through this capabilities acquisition process that you're trying to decipher your way through looking at the slide, that we can get there with an integrated product, an interoperable product on day one for our warfighters. So that's the second thing. And I would argue we collectively don't do that very well. We need to do it much better. And the third thing, which perhaps hits a little more close to home for most of the folks in this, in this room because of why we're here this week, is the operators want to be able to utilize that system on day one to the full extent of its capabilities. And since we typically don't put that new product into combat on day one, what that really means is they want to be able to train to the full extent of the capabilities of what they've been given on day one. But typically what we end up giving them is short in at least three different ways. First is the training systems often lag the introduction of the product to the fleet. And even if they are there, I would, uh, at least from my own personal experience, our simulators are usually a software version behind, if not more, when we initially deliver that capability. So the operators are already starting a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of being able to train to the full capability of that system. And now as we're introducing more and more high-end capabilities, as General Iams mentioned, we've also got a challenge with being able to replicate the environment that we're expecting them to operate in. Despite the, the huge Western complex of ranges and red threat capabilities that we have collectively across the services, there is no way for us to replicate the threat environment so that our users can train to the highest end fight that they're going to be expected to be proficient at. So we, haven't, we don't provide that to them on day one. And then we try and backfill it over the coming years as that system matures. And the third thing where we kind of tie their hands is we go, oh yeah, by the way, for these high-end capabilities, we only want you to train to them at certain hours of the day on certain days of the year in certain geographic locations because the other guys are going to be watching what we're doing and we really don't want them to understand our con ops and see how we're training uh, to that high-end fight. A great example of this kind of rolled into a, a nutshell is NIFCA, Naval Integrated Fire Control Counter Air. Simply put, it's the integration for the air defense battle for our carrier strike groups of F-18s, E-2s, and our Aegis air defense cruisers and destroyers. All of those platforms integrated together, exchanging information uh, to defend the strike group. It takes us basically getting the entire carrier strike group underway in order to provide that high-end training capability for all of the users in that strike group, for the ships, for the E-2s, for the F-18s, and for the strike group staffs. Not only can't we afford to do that, but the opportunity to do that so that our operators can become proficient is extremely limited. And what we need to do is provide that training capability to them on day one. And you all go, well, duh, that's live virtual constructive. And I go, well, duh, we don't provide that to them today. We try and backfill it after we deliver the product. We can look at any number of things that we've introduced over the last five or six years while we've talked about LVC, where we still don't have that capability built into the baseline when it's delivered to our operators. So when I talk about starting with the end in mind on this capabilities-based acquisition concept, it's those three things. 
It's being able to fully train with a fully integrated and a fully characterized system on day one. And I firmly believe that this capabilities-based acquisition system, which is about creating the models that we need to build that constructive, interoperable, integrated environment and make it available on day one, is not just an accident of this process, it is the end result of this process, a digital representation of the system that we're giving to our operators. That's what we owe them, that's what we need to dedicate our efforts to. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I look forward to your questions. Thanks, G9. Now invite uh, General Lundy to uh, make some opening remarks. Well, good morning. It's great to be with all of you. In the, uh, I don't have any slides, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit but not have a slide. So maybe next year I'll put one out. But uh, what, I, what I want to talk about is kind of where where we are as an army and what our challenge is. Because, you know, for the last 16 years, we've been solving a very discrete problem. And, and really it is where our culture is today, not only when we think about how we train and develop leaders, but it's, it's permeated our culture as an army, as an institution, and frankly, the joint force as an institution. When you think about where we've been in the range of military operations focused in counterinsurgency and stability operations, for the army, what that's done uh, has presented us a number of challenges we think about the current operational environment. You know, 10 years ago, it probably was not, it absolutely was not on the forefront of anybody's mind, you know, that we might be engaged against a peer or near peer threat or regional threat. And how we prepared and executed counterinsurgency operations, stability operations, counterterrorism operations is very, very different than how we change, how we train and prepare for large scale combat operations against a peer threat in contested environments. And that's our challenge today as we make that transition, as we change that culture, because when you do something for 16 years, that, that has a pretty significant imprint, uh, not only on the soldiers and the leaders, but on the institution. And I would say that it has a significant imprint, not only on our institution, but on industry as well. Because the problems you've been solving aren't necessarily the problems we need to solve tomorrow. So this is kind of what I wanted to talk a little bit about today. Um, and really, how do, how do we get there? And, and what does it mean to have to be able to change this culture, to be able to change all these institutions? And when you think about the fight and the number of casualties that we've had, and yes, we've had a number of casualties, that may be the opening hours of the next fight against a peer threat. So that, that really should change how we think about a sense of urgency and what it's going to take to prepare our joint force. When you look at jointness, we've been joint at the squad level. And, and there's a belief, frankly, in our culture right now that we've never been more joint. And I would argue that we're probably more disjointed right now because we haven't had to exercise the muscle at the higher echelons. We've been in a fairly stable environment within the conflict continuum. And when you think about stability operations and counterinsurgency, We've built procedural controls because we haven't been in a very dynamic environment. It's been dynamic at the small unit level, but not dynamic up at echelon, and it's caused our higher echelons to atrophy in their skills. And we think about prosecuting a deep fight, whether that's a deep lethal fight or a deep non-lethal fight, how much agility do we have at echelon when we think in the Army, at division, at corps, at field army level, or when we think within the joint force, all that joint structure that we have within the combatant commands, how agile and adaptive are we to be able to prosecute targets across all of the domains simultaneously to be able to present multiple dilemmas? We don't have the capability to train that way right now, and that's where we need to move to, and that's where the Army is pursuing the synthetic training environment, is to be able to scale at echelon from the small unit level in these very complex environments all the way up through our higher echelons where we can train you know, our field armies, our corps, and our divisions. Because over the last 15 years, our higher echelons have been kind of at the strategic and operational level. And if we face a peer threat, those higher echelons are going to actually be operating at the tactical level, which is a much more dynamic, much more complex fight. But if you look at, you know, a multi-core fight where we've got, you know, potentially a MEF, a U.S. Army Corps, and a NATO Corps that may be operating together with multiple divisions, multiple brigades, 
Think of the complexity of that compared to what we've been doing where we've had five brigade combat teams and maybe a MEB covering down on an entire country. All of that will be just in one very small area and it's gonna be operating across multiple domains that will be all contested by peer uh, capabilities. So these are the challenges that we have and this is how we have to think about how we transform, how we train and how we develop not only virtual and constructive simulations, but how we also train live. You know, General Perkins mentioned this morning the combat training centers. For us, the thing that drives change the fastest within our Army after we write our doctrine, which we've just produced new doctrine for large-scale combat operations, FM-30, that we just released in October, is how we drive change through our combat training centers. And how we do that is not just through live or virtual and constructive capabilities, which we use extensively to wrap around those live exercises, but how do we do the live training aids devices, simulations, and simulators that help us with the live training piece. So again, a live virtual constructive construct um, expanding out what we currently have today. And that gets to everything, not only from your constructive wrap, but it's also all your targetry that's out there. It's all your battlefield effects. We've underinvested on those things as an army because we, we haven't had to, to build that complex of a live fire environment. Uh, we've just started to put an integrated air defense out there. And we really focused on you know, the Army first, but then it was a matter of, well, how do we get the joint partners to come play? Because they've got to have the training value. So we had to put an entirely different set of capabilities just to train the Air Force because they use different training systems than us. But the value of doing that was we brought the Air Force, we give them a better training event, so they're going to come train with us at the CTCs. But as a joint force, we got to think about that in the future, that we don't have to build discrete, you know, capabilities that, uh, that, I, that we have to federate across the joint force. So I think those are the challenges that we face as we move to the future. And being able to scale our capabilities through the synthetic training environment to where you can virtualize and train a squad to the same level of intensity that you can train a field army staff, that's a real challenge. And there's gonna be common things, modules, layers of that environment that I think will transition and allow us to experiment and do testing but I firmly believe that we're gonna to have to have a separate set of requirements for those three communities, and that'll be something I'll talk about later on the afternoon panel. But as we think about the training piece, you know, scaling it at echelon for the Army is very important from the squad all the way to the field Army. Being able to bring our joint partners into play, absolutely critical. And then as we think about multinational interoperability, which is a real wicked challenge for us right now, given the number of partners that we have out there and to what level that interoperability is gonna to need to be. This drives really an entire approach from an open architecture perspective and being able to modularize these capabilities so you don't have to go in and like rebuild the entire machine wherever you need to make change on it. And that's probably the last thing I would say is we've gotta be able to adapt to that environment that I talked about because the environment that we have today, it will be not the environment we have tomorrow. It's gonna to continue to change and you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, we have, you know, we already start out at least one update behind on our simulations and they progressively get more behind. So we've got to make systems that are very easy to update and don't have to require going in and rebuilding the entire uh, mechanism there as we go in. So I look forward to taking your questions and uh, further discussion today, but thanks, thanks again. So with uh as we go towards the end of the panel, I don't want to reemphasize again the, the idea of, of uh, written questions. So if you have them, the staff will be going through. Uh, it's probably a pretty good time to start collecting those up. I'd like to now introduce General Smith. Thank you, Admiral. Um, distinguished flags and industry leaders. I thought I'd switch it back up here because my OSD lead has stood at the podium, so I will dutifully do what he did. It also, if I say something untoward, it, my block letters aren't right in front of me, so you won't remember who I am. Um, I want to, let me cast a little bit, I'm going to go back and forth here, prepared remarks, but a lot of it, it would be redundant to what my uh, distinguished panel members have said. Uh, but I want to get something up front, which my chief of staff reminded me the very first time I gave a similar pitch on readiness and training and so forth. And he listened very graciously and said, yeah, we have to work on that. That's a challenge. That's an opportunity. Um, 
but shut up, Smith. We're the best at this in the world, and we're going to keep getting better. So it's a positive story. There's a golden opportunity right now. As Secretary Wilson, Secretary of the Air Force, is, is uh, fond of saying, right now we're in a period of where we have time and comparatively no resources, no money, but we will get to a point where we have no time but plenty of resources. And if we squandered this window of opportunity to think through the challenges and how to address them and get after these things, we all see on the horizon. We all see the requirement to get after the synthetic training, to get after the learning continuum for individual soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. It's there. It's right in front of us. And so I really appreciate what Mr. Ariel said in the opening session about partnership and true partnership. And let's get beyond that as a word and make it a practical reality. Industry has to get to a point where it's not about owning every aspect of it in propriety. And, um, we have to get to a common architecture that all industry is able to lay in on. Um, and for our part, our acquisition process, for one, is antiquated and lethargic. It is an industrial age one. I don't know how to shape it. I don't know how to fix it. But if we want to get after policy, sir, that's, that's the first place I'd start. We can't respond swiftly enough. Your great ideas from industry, your great capabilities, they're even at their 60 70 percent solution, it's good enough. Get it in the hands of our airmen, marines, sailors, and coast guardsmen. Let them play around with it, and they're going to advance the tactics, techniques, and procedures that those can develop. So that is our imperative, uh, the Air Force right now, is to anticipate the rapid changes occurring that will influence the uncertainty and complexity on all facets of the process, from acquisition to execution within the training environment. By exploring and harnessing new concepts and technologies, the Air Force's focus on operational training infrastructure will not just be another policy buzzword, but will be the way we operate for the next generation. The simple fact that all we do in the Air Force relates back to training. It is a source of developed expertise in any mission set. It is also the primary tool of, to both sustain excellence and ensure the Air Force progresses as a learning organization. Training gives the Air Force a world-class capability and underwrites mission readiness. Therefore, it is critical that the institution appreciates the training readiness continuum, which impacts every aspect of what we do and the investment decisions we make. This necessitates a persistent assessment, decision, and action loop, wherein training is informed by practical experiences and technological developments and informs the same by refining TTPs and driving requirements. Absent this mature input-output cycle, the Air Force would not only miss capitalizing on potential improvement, but also likely find it incapable of meeting the demands of forthcoming challenges across all domains. You know, historically, the United States has done a pretty good job of catching up. World War II, at the outset, we were a paltry Air Force, and soon we're producing over 300,000 airplanes. In the last year of the conflict, we could produce, reproduce the, all the planes lost on Pearl Harbor in a single day. That was because the industrial base kicked into overdrive and partnered up. In terms of training technology, we've done the same too. In, in Vietnam, we got to a kill ratio that was really unacceptable. It was at times less than two to one, uh, blue versus red. So what did we do? We recognized that on average, a fighter pilot, if he could get by his first 10 missions, he would probably survive his whole deployment. So a bunch of smart kids, a bunch of majors actually, uh, got together and developed the idea of the training um, we know now as Red Flag. Um, it was all done within a, a year's time, conception to execution. And the idea was at home environment, with a hard threat environment, you could train those airmen up through their first combat sorties and, and go forward. And it had tremendous results. So we've been able to do it historically in terms of industrial base as well as training technology. I think we're in a, a similar inflection point right now. Um, are we, where are we in terms of meeting our training environment to the emerging technologies of would-be adversaries? I would suggest to you, personal opinion, is that the United States has, has ridden a long time in the Air Force in particular on just the world's greatest technology. And I think we still hold it. But that gap is closing. And so the, the undercurrent, the under pillar, if you will, um, I'm not in construction, you can tell, uh, is, is that training edge. So one for one, if I give my worst adversary the exact same weapon system, I don't care where it, where it is, cyberspace, in the air, yeah, we're still win every day on, and even on Sunday. 
because our training environment is a lot more intense, a lot more robust. It's got to be realistic because that's the key to all the training. We live in a society, the majority of us have experienced some level of virtual worlds of realism, whether through gaming, amusement parks, and immersive programs. We can no longer train in a non-realistic environment and expect to achieve dominant results. Operational training must be institutionalized by incorporating training considerations into established processes of acquisition and weapons fielding. Our current threat environments only replicate a portion of potential adversaries' capabilities. The Air Force must be able to replicate the most lethal and proliferated, proliferated kinetic and non-kinetic threats live and or synthetically by establishing a relevant non-proprietary threat environment based on authoritative and accredited data. The United States must maintain a qualitative advantage by being better trained in multi-domain, full-spectrum employment, which allows weapon systems and operators to interact in a highly dynamic, realistic manner. The Air Force holds reinvigorating air, space, and cyber training capabilities to regain full combat capability at a high priority. To do this, we need to construct a relevant training environment which allows weapon systems and operators to interact in a highly dynamic, realistic manner, including multi-domain command and control aspects. As was mentioned earlier, that's two domains is probably insufficient. We need to get after how do you interconnect all. Our focus on operational training infrastructure will change how the Air Force approaches operational training to maintain and generate readiness across the entire spectrum of mission capabilities. We will develop this infrastructure holistically across all domains and spectrums via 13 lines of effort resident in our OTI flight plan. I'll just uh, highlight one or two. One is establishing a relevant and realistic training environment, which hinges on the successful fielding of a synthetic to live, live to synthetic training capability. This line of effort will establish the tasks, timelines, and milestones to transition from the current state of fielding a comprehensive, secure, and realistic capability. To do this requires comparable commitment to honest introspection, innovation, and investment. A similar effort today compared to the generation of red flag to improve survival and operational effectiveness is far more complex. Acquisition is a key and fundamental component of operational training infrastructure, procurement, and sustainment. Effective synthetic training requires simulators to be concurrent with the actual weapon system while providing adequate fielding, uh, fidelity, and interoperability for the required training, and all with the requisite cybersecurity. Connecting operational and training infrastructure resources for distributed training requires secure comms capabilities that meet the bandwidth, latency, and reliability requirements for real realistic interactions. Connections between sites can be persist persistent or on-demand based on the training requirements of participants, but non-proprietary to meet evolving integration requirements. As we employ our most advanced weapon systems, operation security concerns and threat density requirements for advanced systems drive more complex training into the simulator. Moreover, advanced sensors are not easy to fool. Therefore, that threat em emulators must be very close to the actual systems in every aspect, which of course drives up cost. The integration of virtual and constructive capabilities into live ranges is the only means to replicate the full scale, robust operational capabilities and support a realistic environment that supports all the functional communities. The challenge is the synthetic environment is not ready to meet our needs. And we are looking to industry to meet these challenges and enable us to employ a cross-domain training architecture for air, space, and cyber operational training infrastructure systems that spans the gamut from individual platform simulators to networked systems interacting with live environment. So I'll just close and say that this is, a, again, a window of opportunity. We do have time. We do have resources to move after this. But the current paradigm of how we do things, as the other gentlemen have said, it breaks us. You can argue what, how much should be live, how much should be synthetic, and, and at the end of the day, we can, we can keep that argument aside and just look at the fact numbers. I can take a ledger out and tell you that once we field the F-35, the flying hours per cost per flying hour will break the bank. So you just have to go. So say nothing if you want to protect some capabilities. So that's what we're getting after. I look forward to finding more Don Ariels among the industry group 
and we in our part will try and get after the acquisition uh, wall in many ways. Thank you. So the questions are being gathered. Uh, I'd like to invite our last panelist, uh, Brigadier General Heinrich Sommer from NATO, who's going to give us a the joint and inter uh, international perspective. Admirals, generals, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of General Mercier. French Air Force, Supreme Allied Commander of Transformation, he regrets that he's not able to be here today to address you. He is in Berlin with Supreme Allied Commander Europe, briefing the 29 NATO nations on how the NATO command structure should adapt and be fit for purpose for a changing world. I'm very honored to be here this morning and to exchange some thoughts with you on how NATO, as an alliance, is adapting by harnessing technology to the rapidly changing security environment to defend, to deter, and to project stability. As you know, NATO is a political and military organization assembling 29 nations from Europe and North America to pursue a common goal of protection and defense of its territory and populations, and more broadly committed to maintain peace and stability. Today, almost 70 years after its inception, the principles and the content of the North Atlantic Treaty still stand. Should we rewrite it today, we would see that it's still very valid. This does not mean that the Alliance has not been able to adapt itself throughout its existence. On the contrary, NATO, like many successful and enduring organizations, has been able to continuously adapt itself to the changing environment with the resources and the resolve to ensure a leading role on the world stage as an international security hub. My command, Allied Command Transformation, ACT, is responsible to make sure this happens. ACT is one of the two strategic commands in NATO. The other one, Allied Command Operations, is in Belgium in Europe. Norfolk in Virginia is the home of ACT in North America. ACT strives to be the driving force for transforming NATO's combat system in the face of a constantly evolving and unpredictable geostrategic environment. The Supreme Allied Commander Transformation Vision focuses on strengthening the credibility of the Alliance's deterrence and defense posture through innovation at all levels in order to enhance NATO's operational capability. Before we can answer the question, how do we harness technology to win in a complex world, I need to elaborate on what is the complex world that NATO is facing. One thing is clear, in the current complex global security environment, no nation or organization can manage a crisis on its own. We have a common objective for security, whatever the threat, detect, identify, and understand the early signs of a crisis avoid escalation and de-escalate potential developments, and, if this is not possible, be ready to fight and win. Due to the global nature of threats, detection and identification of crisis are not limited to a specific geographical area. The complexity of the security environment requires the creation of an ecosystem made up of a wide network of partners, including nations, international organizations, NGOs, the private sector, industry, academia, to name just a few to share information, provide early warning, share awareness, and the maximum use of existing expertise. In addition, de-escalation of a crisis requ requires rapid and coordinated decision making. NATO is developing exercises through realistic scenarios to provide political military leaders with the understanding of the challenges they may face when a crisis develops. Finally, we need to be prepared to act together when necessary in crisis, combining multiple domains, including new areas of warfighting such as cyberspace or information operations. 
Interoperability is essential, as was demonstrated in Afghanistan, when NATO and non-NATO forces from various continents deployed together but could not initially connect their systems. Responsiveness requires the development of standards and norms to enable command and control systems to be connected from day one. So how do we harness technology to win in this complex world? NATO approach is to embrace innovation as an essential tenant of its adaptation to the actual and foreseen security environment. We intend to use innovative approaches, methodologies, and processes to constantly improve our military capacity, foster interoperability, and provide NATO forces with the capabilities required to fulfill NATO's tasks and meet the Alliance's level of ambition. Let me introduce two initiatives that may be of your interest. NATO is developing an innovation network in line with the open innovation concept. Open innovation is a well-known concept related to the implementation of a more distributed, more participatory, and more decentralized approach to innovation. The NATO Innovation Network would assemble a community of all NATO and national entities, eventually including partners, committed to open innovation. These entities could consist of armed forces laboratories, innovation hubs, centers and incubators, academia, center of excellences. Such network would be a force multiplier with the aim of leveraging the vast existing intellectual potential, generate ideas to be experimented with, and even conduct joint implementation. In another initiative, NATO will set the conditions that would allow multinational collaborative development, adaptation, and feeling of advanced technology-based military capabilities. Implementation of technology-based capabilities would only be feasible if NATO nations adopt collectively a number of cardinal principles throughout the entire capability life cycle. This includes, but is not limited to, the principles of interoperability by design, modularities, open architecture, collective de-risking, experimentation, and sharing of best practices throughout the development process. One example of this works will be presented tomorrow at the special event on cloud-based simulation, hybrid reality, operational readiness of modeling and simulation as a service. Modeling and simulation as a service is a project of the NATO Modeling and Simulation Group that started by the request of ACT four years ago. In this project, the principle of open innovation and cooperative development, as explained before, have accelerated the production and demonstration of a NATO modeling and simulation as a service technical concept with its associated portal, architecture, processes, and governance principles. Modeling and simulation as a service is now ready to become a capability and will be working with the nation to achieve this capability in the next years. For example, we are helping the nations to select opportunities for experimentation and demonstration in NATO. For example, in the exercise CWIX, which trains interoperability, or the Trident series exercise, which are strategic exercises in NATO. Another example is the NATO Innovation Challenge 2017, which has just been concluded. The purpose of this year's NATO Innovation Challenge was to tap into the minds of innovative people and teams to find more effective and efficient way ways for NATO to stabilize trouble areas and save lives. The challenge scenario cantered on assisting a major metropolitan area to stabilize and recover from a breakdown in civilian order after being struck by a superstorm. We received 54 proposals addressing scenario-related issues on medicine, security, logistics, and energy. And among the 54 solutions submitted, some proved to be worth giving a chance to be further developed. NATO has determined some potential ways to leverage those solutions. That includes the NATO Chief of Transformation Conference, which takes place in Norfolk next month, and the exercise Trident Juncture 2018. NATO Innovation Challenge 2017 was the first step towards developing an environment allowing NATO and the nations to collaborate and engage with solution providers worldwide and influence the market of innovative solutions in the defense sector 
through open innovation events. I think these two examples provide a good picture on what NATO intends to do to harness technology and innovation in support of the warfighter. In closing, I will invite you to visit the NATO booth at the exhibit floor to learn more about what NATO is doing. Thank you for your attention. And the winner is, so as I sort through these, I'd like to start with a general question for the, for the panel. Uh, one of the sort of continuous issues year to year is how do we assimilate technology at a faster rate uh, in DOD? Uh, can you give me some examples or some ideas about uh, how your services or organizations are approaching speeding up the system acquisition-wise? OK. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me say, first of all, we're trying. Um, and we have a long way to go, as I think all the panelists alluded to. Um, I, I won't ask to put the slide back up, but one of the things that we have to get much better at um, is our relationship with industry. Um, uh, and this is a little hard to describe, but today we often have a, a somewhat adversarial relationship. It's, it's very much based on a contract that we have in place, uh, which we need to have with industry, but it allows us very limited flexibility in most cases. And uh, if we truly want to move more quickly, we have to f be able to figure out how to get um, I'll say novel contracting strategies in place that allow both the government and industry to adapt in stride during a program development when new technologies or new opportunities present themselves. And today what we tend to do is go, no, we can't do that, we're going to have to wait for increment two or increment three because I've got this monolithic program of record that I've got to fix. First, I've got a contract that says industry has to do A, B, and C, and if I try and insert D in, in there, it's going to create a six-month, 12-month delay in the program. It's going to cost millions of dollars more. Um, and that's the way we run our programs. That's not the way you all operate in a commercial model, and we have to figure out how to change our contracting strategy and to some extent our legal relationship with each other so we can make those iterations real time, again, as the opportunities arise. Um, I'll leave it at that in the interest of uh, giving the other folks an opportunity to take on that one. Well, I would say, you know, at least in this space uh, and probably over on the network side of the house, we've got a lot of opportunity because there's a significant commercial market. And any place you have a significant commercial market, we've got to learn to be able to take advantage of that. You know, it's hard for us to go out and find a commercial tank out there, uh, you know. But, but we certainly have lots and lots of crossover points from an education and training perspective. And I think as we look at, at our future and some of, the, some of the work that we're doing right now of looking at other transaction authorities and, and other methods on how we're going to adjust our acquisition processes, I think our, our opportunity to excel and be able to do something very quickly and learn uh, new ways to acquire and break down some of these problems and barriers that we've got I think this community is the one that's ripe to be able to do that in because there's lots of mature, commercially viable capabilities out there that we can apply today. Uh, and frankly, Marie Gervais, who runs, she's the director of CACT for me, that's one of the areas she's working right now is how do we innovate faster with industry, do DevOps, and be able to work to the left of what would be a milestone B to understand you know, more mature technologies that we could pursue and, and that's where we're headed right now. We certainly don't have it all figured out. We, we did it with one capability so far, Striker Virtual Trainer, where we saw some, some potential there. And, uh, and I think we're going to see this. We'll work through this over the next uh, six, to, six months to the next year uh, with the synthetic training environment, at least components of it. So that's kind of our approach right now. Clearly, it's a problem. Clearly, there's challenges. And uh, we do need some policy help. But uh, I think we're identifying those right now that we'll be forwarding up to Mr. Drummond here at the end of the day. But uh, anybody else want to? I'd like to offer um, first to, to say I'm speaking 
in place of General Imes, probably not from his perspective, but as an acquisition program manager, I would offer that one of the things we can do is use every tool in the toolbox. Our contracts are the, the primary way that we view our, our path to acquire technology, but there are also other tools in, in, in terms of uh, CRADAs, STTRs, SBIRs, um, industry days, opportunities to do market research. I would offer that ITSIC is the best concentrated market research opportunity for training technology in the world. And to, you know, if you come here to ITSIC um, more than the first time without a collection plan and treat this as, as a, a market research opportunity, ITSIC could be better uh, used to better advantage. One other thing I'd like to offer for your consideration is the, the DAU, uh, USD ATNL integrated lifecycle management wall chart, otherwise known as the saddle blanket that everyone loves to hate. Um, if you step back from that to where you can't read any of the letters on there and you just look at the colors, we're very comfortable with the idea of a battle rhythm for operations. But in terms of capabilities development, if you look at that pink shaded region at the top that is the JSIDs, the requirements generation, and the yellow section in the middle, defense acquisition management, and the PPBES in the green section at the bottom, we have to have a synchronization in those battle rhythms. JSIDS is a need-driven, acquisition management is a, uh, an event-driven, and PPBES, of course, is a calendar and schedule-driven. But we need to sync those up to generate as much tempo as possible to get that technology into our acquisition programs, even if it's out of cycle of our next planned block. We need to have uh, develop ways to get to that. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I've got a foursome here of similar things that I'll, I'll kind of roll out as a general question. Uh, the, uh, there's an appearance that many of the services have a synthetic training environment program in works. Uh, is, this a, is there a possibility this could turn into a joint venture, or what is being done to, to build a cross-service uh, STE, if you will, if anything. Uh, we absolutely want to see joint interest in it. Um, and as you think about how we scale, you know, like I said, the Marine, the Marine Corps and us have very, very similar requirements, but we also have a lot of crossover requirements, both the Navy and, and the Air Force. So I think there's tremendous utility from it being a joint program. Uh, so I see, you know, a program with joint interest, certainly. Um, and, and I think it's not only needs to move to a joint interest program, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, it does cross across. There's value in the experimentation community, there's value in the testing community, as well as the training and education community. And I think there'll be crossover points there. So w will it be a one-size-fits-all? No, but I think when you, when you look at the common level of terrain, so when we think about one world terrain to where we can go anywhere in the world virtually, and again, you've got You've got to be able to scale not only at Echelon, but you've got to be able to scale at Fidelity. So when we think about what we're going to put in a, you know, a fighter simulation, the level of Fidelity in that virtual, uh, that virtual piece of terrain is very different than what we need in a constructed piece of terrain, a uh, much lower level of Fidelity. Uh, and the same thing with you know, the requirements that we have within experimentation and testing. You might need some very finite, exquisite um, detail in a testing community where you want to know the torque on a nut or a bolt, whereas you don't need that in a training environment. So I think there's a lot of crossover, and I think we do have a good bit of joint interest. Uh, we are having discussions with you know the Marine Corps, um, and we're probably further along on a multinational discussion than we are with our joint partners. Uh, but that's <laughs> okay. certainly an area that we've got to go. All right. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. It's, it's kind of, <clears throat> there are pockets of incredible examples where there is some great joint partnership going on in developing capabilities, or some of the medical community in particular. Um, that it's not pervasive across all is a little uh, frustrating. But I'll tell you, the Air Force needs to get its house in order first. We have one airplane called the C-17. There are over 12 different simulators for that one C, and all of them have its different proprietary nature to them. So there's no opportunity to blanketly, if we have a new app, if you will, to smack it into all of them and have them operating. So we have, we're, we're getting after that problem set within the Air Force, so the more our house is in order, the more we'll be prepared to uh, interoperable uh, development, work, work on interoperable development, particularly in the synthetic world. S 
Speaking about interoperability, I think uh, NATO is all about interoperability. When you met in 29 nations, must be able to work together. And in, in training and uh, simulation, uh, what does NATO own? We know own command and control. The capabilities are provided by the nation, so command and control is essential for us. So, so we need systems with uh, uh, distributed training because we are 29 nations sitting across Europe and North America that we can do training uh, on command and control to do uh, training on war fighting. So, so basically, uh, interoperability also down to the tactical level is, is what NATO is doing. Uh, we do uh, create a lot of standards so it enables uh, the different kind of capabilities to speak together. Uh, and I, I, I think it's the same challenge and, and even a bigger challenge than, than US with the services, uh, interoperability with the services uh, that, that NATO has. But we have definitely identified that if you build in interoperability from the beginning by design, it will be a lot cheaper later on. It's very expensive to add interoperability into a system when it's all already fielded. So, so we are trying to make it easy for the nations to have interoperability on all kind of uh, capabilities and training systems. Thank you. Uh, I believe back in 2005 when the Army's Live Virtual Constructive Integrating Architecture, um, JSID's document was, went before the JROC, they were uh, designated as the lead service for Live Virtual Constructive. The Marine Corps did a capabilities-based analysis and determined we had some Title X responsibilities that required slightly different requirements, but interoperability and the Marine Corps' Live Virtual Constructive training environment, um, JSID's document, ICD, was to be an appendix and fully interoperable with the Army, and we've always pursued that. And I would offer one, um, one example of the collaboration that's possible is the Army and the Marine Corps' memorandum of agreement between my program office and PM Trade for live training transformation standards, developing standards-based um, standards based acquisition policy that allows us to quote that in uh, RFPs to industry so that we're both buying interoperable um, capabilities or at least systems for which interoperability can be achieved without an excessive cost. And we're spreading that from the live training domain and range instrumentation into virtual and constructive simulations and trying to remain very closely uh, synchronized with the Army and um, Navy and Air Force as well. And, and briefly, Fred, you had a... And briefly, my office is uh, in, involved in this across the board from uh, understanding and uh, helping push, for instance, the uh, persistent cyber training environment. Uh, Army is the EA for, for cyber training, working in a really good partnership with Major General Frost, but we're looking at the larger picture of how can we provide a, just as one example, a persistent cyber training environment that's applicable to each individual service unit level uh, training capabilities uh, to large joint force and international uh, partnership engagements from that kind of standpoint. That we have compatibility, uh, standardization, uh, easy access in and out uh, for that. Just one of many examples. And another example, which is kind of touched upon here, Talking about spectrum uh, issues and collaboration, so Air Force test may be working on a, uh, a pod for the aircraft that while Navy is updating their tax pod, is the software compatible? So we're dealing with the uh, test organizations, training organizations, and is it all of that compatible with uh, the Fallon ranges, with the Eglin ranges, uh, with the, you know, where the Marines are operating? And then we do the air to ground integration uh, a, di a difficult challenge altogether. And part of our uh, contribution to that then is protecting, in this particular instance, the electromagnetic spectrum encroachment because we may be forced to operate both in the testing and training world in a very restricted band from where we are now. That may impact training or that may impact testing or it may impact both. So understanding uh, that and keeping abreast of those, uh, those challenges and dialogues, that's where we are helping fight the battle and demonstrating the requirements for the services. Jim, real quickly, if anybody has a, a hope of a, a, a huge joint program to attack synthetic training, I'd say don't hold your breath. Um, but as the Colonel mentioned, uh, we have to make sure that our solutions are interoperable in the end. Um, 
and despite what uh, General Smith said about the Air Force needing to get their own house in order, uh, quite honestly, we're pulling lessons learned from the Air Force in terms of LVC training in the attack air environment because uh, the Air Force is ahead of the Navy, frankly. And so we're trying to leverage the work that they've already done. Uh, they allowed us to participate in some exercises this last year, some LVC exercises, so that um, we could expand our own capabilities, but just as importantly, so that we could make sure that what we are developing is interoperable with what the Air Force uh, it already has on the table and is continuing to develop. Um, so that's one small microcosm, but we've got to be able to do that across the board. Okay, thank you. So there's another foursome here of related questions about around the budget. Can, uh, can the panel like to have some opinions about the current state of the budget uh, in that it seems to be going up, but then again, it's uh, got the sequestration still in line and how that might relate to improving current deficits and readiness. We'll let the Air Force answer. I told you it was four <laughs> questions in one. That, that, that's fine. You got all the money you answered. I'm the collateral damage on this panel. I can be. 35. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I missed the first part, Admiral, but it, it just generally about the budget. Yeah, uh, you know, what's, it seems like it's getting better. No, well, the, the single most important thing, as we all know, is I, I need a reliable budget. I need to be able to look. Our, our budget cycle is frustrating enough as it is without this crazy cardiac arrest possibility every, every year or less than a year. So while there was improvements the last couple of years from the Air Force perspective, and we got after some things that were starting to really dilapidate, um, the, the sort of looming cloud on the horizon right now is, is really unnerving. Uh, it will break the United States Air Force if we go into sequester. So it just, we're, we're struggling to get back to readiness. Most of you have probably seen something. Most of our charts are red when it comes to capability. That doesn't mean I can't field a fighter squadron. That means that a fighter squadron whose main mission is suppression of enemy air defenses and has spent the last nine months in the sandbox doing CAS is not ready to do seed. That's why they're red. Big picture, simple example. We'll never get after that. We'll never catch up if, we, if we're going to, right now we're shooting just a little over 70%, about 74% of our stated requirement of operational training infrastructure needs. We're funding at about that level, which is an improvement over the last couple of years. That will drop and that arrow goes down and you don't recover it in a one for one. It's non-linear. You hit, hurt me for six to 12 months financially, set back investments and training and so forth and it's a good two, three years before you can recover all that. Yes, so we are seeing additional funding in the budget uh, in 18. Um, we saw some in the end of 17 with the uh, request for additional um, authorities. Uh, but we've also, I'm, I'm speaking specifically in naval aviation, uh, since 2011, we've also underfunded our readiness accounts to a tune of about $6.6 .6 billion. So this is not something we're going to fix with a couple hundred million dollars being added in 17, 18, 19, or even across the FIDA. Um, so, part, so part of it is resources, but part of it is uh, utilizing those resources more intelligently. And uh, some of the things that are roadblocks that are put in my way, <coughs> excuse me, our way, as the general just alluded to, are continuing resolutions a problem. Uh, as, a, as just one simple example, and I'll pass this on, in the end of FY17, we got additional dollars in the fourth quarter. So we were able to go out and hire more people, uh, get industry under contract to do certain efforts, but just for that quarter's worth of effort. And now as we rolled into FY18, we actually expected a larger budget in most of those same readiness accounts. But we are hamstrung in the first quarter because we can't execute the dollars because we're under continuing resolution. So what we're seeing in terms of our ability to go out and get industry and our own organic capabilities started on some of these readiness things is we get them started, quarter later we got to ramp them back down. Now hopefully if we get a budget sometime in December, we'll be able to ramp them back up. But that is completely inefficient. It's a, not a good use of the taxpayers' dollars uh, and it impacts our ability to dig out of that $6.6 .6 billion hole. Okay. The next question involves uh, an observation that we spend a lot of time and emphasis on simulation at the high level, sort of the big ticket items, and what the panel might think about uh, efforts that are ongoing or potentially that would be 
focused on accession training and training for uh, enlisted or the, you know it's sort of at the at the troop level okay I, I think the question so we're talking about small unit training small unit and and junior enlisted okay you know, sort of individual training as well so where, where you again from a scale perspective you know we, we have spent a good bit of time focused on how do we train the upper echelons because it's hard to put a core or a division into the field so one you, you really can't do that live so that's why we spent a good bit of time thinking about how do we train at that echelon uh, and when you think about a squad you know a squad immersive trainers we've fielded some within the army we've done a lot of work in games for training small unit training situational training exercises and put it down inside uh, all of our schools have simulation capability that we use on a on a daily basis all the way down to we use a lot of IMI frankly in all of our schools you can take an engine apart and put it back together so I think we're pretty aggressive in all that space and really where we found that we need more work and this really comes out of the OSD uh, kind of the, the sec defs uh, driven study the close combat study is how, how do we get this squad immersive trainer um, we've got squad level vehicle trainers that we can train them in uh, and I think we're making we're making pretty good headway right now and at least conceptually I know there's a lot of work out there going on in industry uh, which is good and we're, we're, we're really learning a lot as we look around so I think that's the next place we need to be I think from an education perspective at least from an army perspective when I go down in the schools our, our use of IMI and uh, virtual simulators down there and some live simulators you know I, I can look at all of our maintenance training that we do, all of that's highly automated and very good, and I think we're in a good good space there. But I think on the tactical training piece, at least for the squad immersive trainer, that's kind of our next focus area where, where we see growth, um, certainly, in that area, as well as the individual vehicle sims. Our current vehicle sims are pretty expensive, and we're, we're going to go to a, a, a good enough fidelity, less expensive solution uh, for those. Okay, Again, thank small you. Unit. Uh, just to dovetail off of that, the uh, Marine Corps is partnered with the Army in the pursuit of that common driver trainer replacement that the Army is, uh, is formulating the, the RFP for presently. And uh, the Marine Corps has put our platform unique requirements into that and we're, we're very hopeful that we can have a joint program from which both the Army and the Marine Corps would have almost 100% commonality in hardware components but with our uh, platform unique vehicle dynamics, just a, as one example of, of uh, making training more readily available. And while things like driver training are technical skills that don't gather as much interest as tactical training, they're critically important to force preservation. And the, the Marine Corps in, in FY 13 to 15 suffered $12 million of avoidable mishaps in wheel tactical vehicles and nine fatalities, seven permanently partially disabled. And our driver training simulators could not eliminate that, but they could chip away at a huge portion of that. So we have to invest in the tools to, to train our junior Marines and soldiers and sailors and airmen in how to perform their tasks safely for force preservation so that we can get to the fight. General Imes mentioned the Tactical Decision Kits Initiative, which is a fielding of a system that's very similar. It's a it's deployable virtual training environment plus some additional capabilities developed by the Office of Naval Research with industry partners. And the tactical decision kits have been fielded to 24 infantry battalions since our Assistant Commandant General Walters made the determination that that should happen on January 25th of this year, which is an amazing achievement, not something PM Traces awarded, but our Rapid Capabilities Office at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab did a rapid procurement and fielding of that with new equipment training in progress. This is an important initiative because it gets deployable virtual training environment back to the original vision from ten, over 10 years ago, which was to have a unit organic simulation training capability in the barracks aboard ship when they deploy that will allow them to hit their mission essential tasks and train to a measurable threshold level of proficiency and to get those repetitions and sets that are so expensive in the live domain. So that when you reach that knee in the curve and you can learn no more in simulation, then you're ready to go live and perform at a graduate level instead of learning the basics. 
In, in NATO, we identified a couple of years ago that we need to do training exercises differently, especially exercises with different scenarios. The people who are the same age as, as I probably will remember in the past the big NATO exercises. You probably also remember the reforge your exercise, uh, uh, moving units from US to Europe. And um, we introduced a readiness action plan uh, which is changing the profile of exercises. So we need to have bigger exercises because we need to train with a lot of troops on the ground. In 2015, we had the exercise Trident Juncture, which involved uh, Italy, Spain, and Portugal as the training area with about 30,000 troops participating from all services. And in the future, uh, I, I will see more exercises with a lot of troops involved but of course, they are very expensive, so we can't do it every year. In the past, we did it every four years. But preparing the troops for these, and the headquarters especially, for these huge exercises, I think there, there's a gap here where uh, new technology can exist, uh, assist the headquarters being ready when the troops are on the ground and the exercises are becoming very expensive and they only um, have a short duration. So I think you will see a change in exercise pattern in the future and a new cycle of huge strategic exercises that are being executed in Europe. So in addition to uh, how technology can help small unit and specific skill training, we also have to continue to look at new ways of delivering instruction for that. We have to rethink the old school paradigms. We have to recognize that there are different learning methods and uh, the standard traditional aspect of undergraduate, graduate, master's, doctorate, postdoctorate may not really apply to our force, especially of, of the young people that are getting the services t today. So one aspect of that I will just mention, because I actually did participate directly in a, in a previous life uh, a little bit with the Navy's Ready Relevant Learning as one example of current ongoing efforts of changing the paradigm. And this is where, from a DOD standpoint, especially with our ADL folks, that we're exploring and would continue to push and offer for all the services of how we better can uh, actually train the individual in addition to using today's technology. Yeah, as Fred just mentioned, uh, on the Navy perspective, the direct answer to your question, Jim, is uh, it's called Ready Relevant Learning. And it's a complete revamping of how we are going to train our enlisted sailors across all rates. Um, in a nutshell, it's instead of trying to cram all the knowledge they're going to require for the rest of their career into their heads during uh, A school when they're uh, brand new out of boot camp, it's about in trying to provide them with the training they need to perform the job that they're assigned to at the time. And a key part of that is going to be identifying and delivering the training through whatever method makes the most sense. And that could be through their cell phone and an app, it could be through a virtual, it could be through a headset, it could be through a classroom, whatever it happens to be. And that's what our folks uh, primarily at NOC TSD are working on right now. If you visit their booth out there, I'm sure there's folks there that can talk about that. Uh, and I suspect that the Navy Flag Officer Panel will address that in more detail tomorrow at this same time. Okay, I can't, can't leave the Air Force out of this. Just in short, I think it's the most unexplored and potentially highest return on investment there is down to the individual airman level. We're getting after that in the Air Education and Training Command. Lieutenant General Quast newly took over that command and you're going to see a lot of energy coming out of San Antonio on that. He's been thinking about this for a long time. Okay, the last question is who's going to win the Army-Navy game? <laughs> Go Navy, beat Army. All right. Well, I, I have a, I only got to a portion of them. I apologize for that. I will give out uh, those that have names and addresses to the, the panelists that we didn't reach. But uh, please help me thank them for their efforts today and their great content. So with that, I will close this morning session and uh, release everyone to lunch and then to the program, which I think picks up back at uh, 1330 and the show floor is open. Thank you very much.